I have a dream. This is the four-word title of the famous speech delivered by Martin, Martin Luther King Jr., the American civil right, rights leader and Baptist minister, given on August 28, 1963, in the on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, around 250 people were gathered to listen to this uh, well-remembered speech. And he was calling for the end of racism in his country. And the famous words he uttered was that, I hope or I have a dream that my four children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And indeed, it was a memorable speech. And it impacted the American society in several ways after that delivered speech. And, but for our study this morning, we will not be, we will be considering a series of speeches, not a four-word title, but a book of four sermons given by the prophet Haggai, uh, considered as the second shortest book in the Old Testament, which also impacted the life of God's people during his time. It was a necessary message for the God's people who were experiencing various concerns, not only in their life, but also in their ministry. And what is amazing is that this book or the messages or speeches or oracles of God delivered by the prophet were specifically dated. The first one was dated August 29, the second October 17, the third and the fourth dated December 18, all in 520 BC, within, the, within a four-month period. And that is why one, uh, one theologian said his sermons were dated, but they are not outdated. And so it is worthy. It is worthy of our consideration as God's people in our time. And so the context here is that after the Babylon exile, the people through the, by virtue of the decree of Cyrus in 538 BC were now brought back to the promised land. In fact, they were given provisions so that they can rebuild their own, uh, not only the city of Jerusalem, but more importantly, the temple of their God. And so, there was initial work done, but for many reasons, it stopped and lay idle and in ruins, which necessitated God's rebuke through his prophet Haggai. For over a decade, the temple lay forsaken, for the people cared less, and they were even engrossed with their, their own personal concerns. And so now, during the second reign of Darius, God's, God calls the people back to covenant obedience. For paramount was the rebuilding of the temple, still in ruins and in a miserable state. And for the, for the temple signified an important aspect of God's people. This is not just a simple structure. For the, for the Jewish people back then, it was as it, its significant significance was it signified their determination to put God first in their lives. And also the rebuilding in rebuilding it would be a visible sign of who God is before the nations around, around them that the God of Israel was still in, the bus in business. And so, in the same way as God's people back then were rebuked and made to examine their ways, we need, we need, we also need help in order to reflect and consider our lives as God's people in our own generation. How it is being lived, or some, as some say, how you are investing your life, Thus, our title, Consider Your Ways or Our Ways. So let me invite you once again to open our Bibles to the book of Haggai, or Haggai, chapter 2, 
We will not be reading the whole chapter. We will be reading the first 19 verses of Haggai 2. This is the word of God. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Speak, speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say, who is left among you who say this house is in who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not, for thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations so that the, tre the treasures of all nations shall come in, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. On the 24th day of the ninth month, on the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by, the, by Haggai the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priests about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? The priest answered and said, no. Then Haggai said, if someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? The priest answered and said, it does become unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, so it is with these people. And with this nation before me, declares the Lord, and so with every work of their hands. And what they offer there is unclean. Now then consider from this day onward, before the stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of twenty measures, there were but ten. But when one came to the wine vat to draw fifty measures, there were but twenty. I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and, and hail. Yet you did not turn to me, declared, declares the Lord. Consider the, from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. But from this day on... I will bless you. Now, initially, we considered the rebuke by God's people's failure to rebuild the temple amidst challenges in our first message when we considered chapter 1. They were sinning by pursuing personal concerns. And so, our message last week was the Christian's priority in life is to seek the pleasure and glory of God by advancing his kingdom. And so, thankfully, the people responded by setting their priorities right. And so, by the work of the Spirit, they obeyed the command of the Lord. Tiningnan natin sa nakaraang mensahe kung paano naging makasarili ang mga tao sa halip na gawin ang utos ng Diyos na itayo muli ang kanyang templo, naging abala sila sa kanilang mga personal na gawain sa halip na isulong o gampanan ang kanilang tungkulin, subalit sa pagkilos ng banal na spirito ay tumalima at sumunod sila sa utos ng Diyos. But sadly, right responses don't endure long enough but dips or wane. So another message was needed to uplift and encourage God's people in their continuing work caused by several challenges. Karaniwan yan. Pag may mga hamon, may mga pagsubok, nakakalimutan natin. Kaya kailangan natin na muling paalala 
upang ipatuloy ang gawain ng Panginoon at sumunod tayo sa ninanais niya. Kaya, kaya because temple building was still unfinished, it had to be pursued till the end. And so in this difficult task, it would not require not it would require not just human resolve but greater power to surmount whatever difficulties, challenges, or even obstacles that may lay ahead of you or lay ahead of us. And we are told in what we read in verse 4, when they were told to work, what did God say? For I am with you. Again, in verse 19, towards the end of what we read, the promise, the promise was, I will bless you. In other words, the promised presence and blessing of God is the greatest motivation and encouragement in the labor of God's people in pursuing His work and in advancing His kingdom. So my message for us this morning is like this. God's assured, assured presence is the believer's encouragement and hope amidst difficulties in life and ministry. Tiyak na pres presensya ng Diyos ang pampatibay loob at pag-asa ng mananampalataya sa gitna ng kahirapan ng buhay at ministeryo. God's assured presence is the believer's encouragement and hope amidst difficulties in life and ministry. In these final three messages of Haggai, Chapter 1, we look into the first message. But in chapter 2, we'll be looking into the three final messages of Haggai. And this, they provide encouragement and hope for God's people back then and now in our life and ministry. In fact, this message of Haggai, though a short book, perhaps a very short ministry of his, impacted in the life of God's people during their time. It had an effect. And so, in pursuing God's work, the Spirit encourages by correcting our understanding and our attitude in two specific ways. Firstly, encouragement to faithful service. Panghihikayat sa tapat, tapat na paglilingkod. And secondly, encouragement to obedience and holiness. Paghihikayat sa pagsunod at kabanalan. These two, uh, these two encourage, encouragement we all need as God's people in every generation so that we can uh, be able to pursue or in the, in the midst of struggles and difficulties, we will be able to pursue our life and ministry faithfully to our God. Let us look into the first point, encouragement to faithful service. Panghihikayat sa tapat, ng pagliling, tapat na paglilingkod. Unfortunately, as work progressed, discouragement arose. The mixed reaction of joy and weeping recorded in Ezra 3, the context of which we can uh, look into the book of Ezra, resurfaced. And so the young ones were joyful and excited, but the old ones were disappointed perhaps wept at the sight of the new temple building being, being erected once again. But what is the reason? The reason was that it was an inferior, it was inferior in grandeur and glory to Solomon's temple. Of course, for the young, they did not see, for many of them did not see the glory of the old temple. But for the old folks, as we say, they, they saw how magnificent the Temple of Solomon was. And so when they were seeing and beholding the new temple being erected, it was a poor, a poor one compared with Solomon's temple. And so instead of viewing their present work with joy and enthusiasm, they looked back with sadness by comparison. And how should we reflect on this? This attitude and this uh, sight that we behold, it tells us that your value of service should not be determined by comparison with others, but by conformity to God's will. 
ang halaga ng iyong paglilingkod ay hindi dapat nakabatay sa paghahambing sa iba, kundi sa pagsunod sa kalooban ng Diyos. We noted in chapter 1 that when they put themselves first, the work suffered. Dahil inuna nila ang kanilang sarili na antala ang gawain ng Diyos. Kanya nangyayari kung ang sarili ang binibigang pansin o inuuna sa halip na ang gawain ng Panginoon, nagkakaroon ng abriya sa pagsulong ng gawain ng Diyos. But here in chapter 2, when they put themselves down, the work seemed pointless. Looking on oneself rather than seeking God's will is, a, is hazardous. It undervalues one's gift, thus fail to serve God for God's glory. It misuses the opportunities for faithful service. And at times, it falls, it falls into false humility by thinking lowly of oneself. We are reminded in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 12 of the Apostle Paul's words. It says, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. These were the words of Paul in defending his ministry against the very opponents who compared themselves with him and look highly of themselves. But this should not be the attitude, the false opponents of Paul, but rather we should, we should seek to serve God faithfully instead of looking at the task and the great work ahead of them, they lingered in the past which triggered loss of focus and discouragement, compromising the value of work to be done at the moment. They were doing a very significant work at that. Their failure to do the temple rebuilding was brought them into sin. God's will for them at the moment was to build His temple, and their failure to do it was in fact bringing them into that state of sin. Are you in the habit of comparing your work and ability with others? You, my advice is for you to turn away and repent from such habit. God's temple or church is built by the work of every member exercising their gifts and abilities and even sacrificing time in order to serve the church in advancing the kingdom through the effective work of the Spirit. Do not belittle whatever ability or gift you have, for it is to be used to advance the kingdom of God. Lahat tayo ay binigyan o pinagkalooban ng Diyos ng kakayanan. Huwag mong maliliitin ang munting kaloob na meron ka upang gamitin para sa pagsulong ng karian ng inyong Diyos. And so God had to encourage and exhort them to fix their eyes on rebuilding by twice committing His presence with them. We are told in verse 4, I am with you. His presence had been and will continue to be constant. That is the meaning of these words of encouragement. I am with you. But not only that, in verse 5, we are told that my spirit remains in your midst. It means the continuance, uh, it signifies continuance of verbal action. By me, by, it means that nothing could or would disrupt the communing relationship they had with their God. And thus, the Lord issues three imperatives upon His people in order to set their heart and their minds to the work at hand. He says, be strong, work, and do not fear. The consciousness of God's presence will affect our attitude and even our actions. 
When the Lord says, be strong, it refers to mental toughness. It is not based on one self-confidence, but, in, but of faith that God guarantees success. When He gives you a work to be, to be done, He gives us the grace to succeed because it is His work that we are to do. When they were told to, to work, God's people were to act in response to His promise. He, de he demands work. He demands for His people to work God's purposes out. It doesn't fall from heaven. At an instant, we need to labor in the ministry. But He also says, do not fear. In diff usually, given in difficult circumstances, what is feared determines behavior. And so, awareness of God's presence takes away reason to fear. In fact, it blurs whatever worries you have before you because of your fear in God. The God who knows all things, who is sovereign in all, in all aspects. And so, we can work and labor and be strong in pursuing what He has granted to us. No. We, know, we all know that when you run uh, a sprint, especially a 100 or 200 meter dash, you don't turn your back. Or when you turn your back, it breaks momentum. It distracts you from the goal of winning. In fact, you lose precious seconds, which would be essential for you to win that race or that 100 or 200 meter dash. In the same way, in Christian service, looking back distracts you by withholding rather than giving and serving well. And so the reminder for us is, pursue your service according to God's will, not according to selfish control and comparison. Maglingkod ayon sa kalooban ng Diyos, hindi ayon sa makasariling pagpipigil at paghahambing. It is indeed true that the reality of their condition, the condition of these people coming back after exile of 70 years, were far inferior to God's former work in previous generations. If you would compare the, their state with the earlier state, the Exodus event, they were a far cry. When Israel came from Egypt, there were about more than 600,000 men. And according to historians and theologians, marahil umabot sila ng dalawa hanggang tatlong milyon kasama ang mga bata at kababaihan. But what happens now? Ngayon, according to statistics mentioned there were about 50,000 of them, the initial wave. They were a far cry in number. And we are told that Solomon's temple was magnificent and grand. But now this current temple was much inferior, despite the fact that some of the artifacts was brought back by them so that they can be, it can be used in the rebuilding. But... We need to be reminded, dapat mapaalalahanan tayo. Because what is important is that God was at work in the little and few in advancing His kingdom. For it, was, for it is consistent in the way he, he, will be going, he is going to accomplish His purposes in humble and seemingly insignificant ways. In shaking the nation so that the treasures would, would come in and fill his house with glory, it may have started with how God had been moving kings and rulers to bring about this development, which will eventually bring greater glory, as we are told, than Solomon's temple's glory. And what is that latter or greater glory that Haggai mentions? It is none other than the bodily presence of the Lord Jesus Christ which will bring peace to the people. 
And so how does it translate in Christian service? Ang ating halimbawa sa paglilingkod, ang perpektong halimbawa natin ay walang iba kundi ang ating Panginoong Hesus. Ang paglilingkod natin ay hindi nakabatay sa ibang mga tao o sa kakayanan ng ibang tao, kundi dapat nakabatay sa paglilingkod na ipinakita at ipinamalas ng ating Panginoong Hesus. Christian service is not about our convenience but our willingness to be inconvenienced for the gospel. We are reaching to the lost in the same way as we were rich as lost sinners previously by those who labored who though for, uh, by those who were willing to be inconvenienced so that we will hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ left the heavens, left heaven's glory for the sake of our sins. When we serve because the people you are comfortable with are there, when your own desires and inclinations are met, when it is at your convenient time and place, or perhaps when just forced into it, I'm afraid. This may not be the best gauge or reason for faithful service. And so we are reminded by Haggai, it pays to seriously consider your ways. Let us consider our ways. Service is not just duty, but privilege under our great king. According to uh, Samuel Bolton, wrote in his book, True Bounds of Christian Freedom, wonderful words to encourage us. This Puritan writer, in one of the chapters, spoke about performance of duty. And this is what he said. It was the great end of our freedom and redemption that we might serve God. Christ has not redeemed us from the matter of service, but from the manner of service. He has redeemed us from the slave spirit in service and brought us into a son-like spirit. It is not bondage, but spirit of liberty. And may these words be a continuing encouragement to us as we labor to serve our Master, our God, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But secondly, we find here an encouragement to obedience and holiness, paghihikayat sa pagsunod at kabanalan. Exactly three months after temple work had begun, the third message was given, or the third and the fourth messages were given. According to verse 12 and 13, questions were directed towards the priest who were tasked and had authority to interpret the law and determine between the holy and the holy, unholy and clean and unclean. This is based on our study of the book of Leviticus, specifically Leviticus 10. And the question is, does meat made holy by ritual sacrifices carried under the fold of the robe, that was the usual uh, attire they had, they wore robe, long robes of the priests, which now incidentally was made holy or consecrated by virtue of contact with the sacrificial offering. Does it make other objects holy as well when touched? And what was the answer given? No. And conversely, ritual defilement as a result of contact with a corpse was passed on by further touch. Meaning when you touch dead, or dead animals or persons, you defile yourself. It tells us of the purity laws of the Old Testament, which describes the infectious nature of sin, and that fellowship with God demands purity. You can only have that uh, fellowship with God if you are pure, undefiled. That's why they need to be cleansed. They need to go to, go to some rituals for them to approach God. In, in the purity that God demands from His people. And so they must, they must avoid, avoid whatever causes of uncleanness 
But what does this tell, tell us, this whole matter of ritual purity and defilement? It tells us that holiness is an internal reality brought about by obedience to the gospel. Ang kabanalan ay isang panloob na katotohanan sa puso na dulot ng pagsunod sa Ebanghelyo, pagyakap ng Ebanghelyo ng Panginoong Yesus. Hagay reminded God's people to consider, again, the very words he mentioned in chapter 1, to consider. Uh, this is a short form of the consider your ways he mentioned in chapter 1. This reminds us of Proverb, Proverbs 4.23, that we need to guard our heart. Or in Matthew 6.21, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. These are similar teachings or truth altogether. And so the blessing of God is determined by what you have set on your heart. And the question is, have you set your heart on spiritual reality? Or are you just or it is just by mere external formality. And this question, should ser- you should seriously consider and ponder upon. We thank our visitors who are joining us both physically and online. At hindi po, uh, lubos ang aming pagpapasalamat sa inyong pagdalo. Subalit, naniniwala ako na hindi aksidente na narito kayo. Subalit ang iyong mere physical attendance sa araw na ito, maging sa ilang taon yung pagdadalo, does not make you consecrated or become a holy Christian. Hindi kayo nagiging banal. Hindi kayo nagiging kristyano sa inyong pagdalo. Ito po ay isang resulta ng pagkilos ang pagiging banal ay resulta ng pagkilos ng banal na spirito sa pamamagitan ng conviction upang kayo ay tumalima, sumunod sa panawagan ng Ebanghelyo na kayo ay magsisi sa inyong kasalanan at manampalataya sa Panginoong Yesus dahil siya lamang ang Diyos at tagapagligtas ng mga makasalanan. Mere physical attendance in church does not make you a consecrated or holy Christian. It is a result of the work of the Holy Spirit in convicting grace, enabling you to respond to the message preached, even the songs or hymns sung, and as well as the prayers uttered. And so the temptation is just to sit perhaps comfortably and feel that you are doing well. Dumadalo naman ako, sumasamban, nakikisama naman ako sa pagtitipo ng panambahan ng mga anak ng Diyos. Marahil ang kaisipan nyo ay okay na ako. Tama na yan. Our prayer for you is not just to be content with the routine of attending. And I, I concede that, is, that it is helpful. But that the Spirit's power would create that saving work in your heart. But for, for you who profess to be a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ, Haggai is, Haggai's reminder is to turn from the defiling effect of sin. It does not pay to disobey. It is always easy to revert back to the old ways. This is the history of Israel as a nation. We have been studying books upon books in the Old Testament and this is what we see time and again. They would heed the word, they would repent and turn, but for succeeding generations, they would re- revert back to the old ways. And this is not only true to them. This is true to every one of us if we will not take heed and consider our ways. To please God in worship is to set our hearts aright and live lives that express the reality of the truth we hold daily. You cannot separate the way you worship with the way you live. 
And so our covenant makes us, as a church, makes us accountable with each other. If you, will, if you are watching the various hearings in both in the House and in the Senate, many, uh, one office has been, uh, government office has been invited time and again. It is the Commission on, Commission on Audit or COA. It, it is tasked with providing accountability of public officials. It is for check and balance purposes. And for us, though we are sanctified, yet as believers, we live in a fallen world. And that is why we need the accountability we have in our church to aid and help us in our walk of faith as a means of God's grace. This is a reminder for us. And so the challenge is with prayerful consideration, set your heart to live a life of obedience and holiness to the Lord. This is a continuing call of this pulpit to God's people, to believers, regardless of age, regardless of your stature, there is that call for obedience and life of holiness. The holy God demands obedience and thus Sin issues must be dealt with immediately, for it has the power to corrupt, contaminate, when not dealt with radically. We are reminded in Matthew 18 and verses 8 and 9, if your hand causes you to sin or foot causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eyes causes you to sin, pluck it out. Of course, we do not do this literally. But the reminder is we have to deal with our sin issues radically. You cannot toy with sin and believe that you would escape unscathed. We always tell our kids, do not play with fire. You will get burned. But mere resolve is not sufficient to deal with sin. You need to prayerfully seek God's grace, not only for protection, but also to resist temptation. Remember that sin will always keep you from prayer, but prayer will lead you out of sin. And remember that your access is never based in yours, and mind's sinlessness, but Christ's accomplished work. It is only to the power of the gospel that we can take the grace to be able to resist and fight sin in whatever form, in whatever way, in our life. And the fourth message delivered on the same day, December 18, 520 BC, when God gave a message to Zerubbabel that he will overthrow nations and kingdoms, it was meant to encourage his people of his promised blessing, the sending of his promised Messiah as the real hope of his people. And so when God removed the signet ring, which was a symbol or which was a symbol of authority and privilege back then before they were carried uh, to exile in Babylon in Jeremiah 22, 24 from Jehoiachin, it appeared that the hope for a Davidic king had ended. But Zerubbabel, an ancestor of Jehoiachin and, and of the Davidic line, was made like a signet ring, thus guaranteeing the certainty of God's covenant promise that David's greater son will reign. And of course, it points us to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of the Lord Jesus Christ, victory is assured. The power of sin has been broken. No sin is worth keeping at the cost of keeping Christ. My dear brothers and sisters, it is to the power of the gospel that we can fight all sin. Live in obedience, 
a life of holiness, not only for our own good, but as a witness of the power of the gospel before this world to the glory and honor of our God. Thomas Watson in his Puritan Thomas Watson in his book Heaven Taken by Storm reminds sinners it may be the last time that God would speak to us through his word. It would be the last sermon that you would ever hear. We may go the place of hearing to the place of judging. And so the call and the reminder for us, for any sinner, kung merong isang makasalanan na hindi pa tumatalikod sa kanyang pagkakasala at tumasampalataya sa Panginoong Jesus, muli ito ang panawagan. Ang panawagan ng Panginoon, baka itong huling mensahe na maririnig, maririnig mo upang ang iyong kaluluwa ay maligtas sa nakaambang parusa na nakarar, nararapat para sa isang makasalanan katulad mo, subalit may pag-asa na kalaan. At iyon ay dahil sa ating Panginoong Hesus na nabayubay sa krus para sa iyong kaligtasan, kaibigan. At nawa ito ay maging paalala sa iyo. May this be a reminder not only for those who are, who are without Christ to turn from their sin, but for us as God's people to continually fight our struggle with our remaining sin. And victory has been assured because Christ has died and has risen. And this is a wonderful truth that we need to hold on and for us to consider. And thus, for to our response, we will be singing the hymn, More Holiness Give Me. It says in verse 1, More holiness give me, more striving within, more patience in suffering, more sorrow for sin, more faith in my Savior, more sense of His care, more joy in His service, more purpose in prayer. This very truth. This prayer and very truth reminds us of what we just meditated upon. And may this be true to us as we respond to God's word by singing this hymn. More holiness, give me. Let us close in prayer. Our great God and loving Father, we are truly grateful for we have your wonderful words to encourage to challenge us, to help us ponder and consider our ways in the way we live our lives, in living our lives and in serving the cause of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. There will be those occasions that we will feel down and unworthy or perhaps lazy and slothful. But indeed, O oh God, may your words be a continuing encouragement and a challenge for us. For we are reminded that faithful service is not about comparing our abilities with others, but in conformity with your will. Help us to strive to labor in whatever our capacity and whatever ability that you have granted to us, may we take hold of every opportunity to spread the word, to advance the kingdom as you have granted to us. But also, O oh God, part of our witness, part of your desire for your people is for us to live obedient and holy lives grounded in your word as a witness to this world that is in rebellion against you and your good intentions and desire for sinners like us. But we pray, O oh Father, that as we, as your word reverberate in our hearts, as your words speak to us, may you have a word and a reminder for those who are without Christ. Kung meron man pong 
isa na hindi pa kumikilala sa Panginoong Hesus, na hindi pa tumatalikod sa kanyang pagkakasala at tumampalataya sa Panginoong Hesus, kayo po ang mangusap sa kaluluwang iyon. Abutin niyo po siya ayon sa inyong biyaya. But for us, as your people, may this be an encouraging reminder, an, an continuing encouragement and reminder that as your people, we display the power of the gospel in the way we live our lives and even in our worship. Grant us the grace to live in conformity, conformity to, this, to the words of the Lord Jesus Christ so that through our lives, the world may be rebuked and the world will see the power of the gospel. Thank you, dear Father, for this truth. We ask that you would bless each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.